there's a moving passage in Whitaker Chambers' autobiography, Witness, where he talks about how at a period of appalling crisis in their lives, he and his wife bought a wild, lonely farm in western New Jersey. It was the first outcropping, he writes, of a need that was to die down, but never again to die out of my life, and was finally to dominate it. My need to live close to the land as I had when a boy. In the spring of 1932, that craving seized me like an infection, which I could not throw off and which made me physically ill. I felt that life was not worth living if it had to be lived away from the land. I know exactly what he meant. Certainly not alone in that, or in being an environmentalist. But I'll tell you this, all my life I've had this recurring nightmare where I head back into the woods behind my parents' old place on Georgian Bay and I find a road or condominiums and I wake up in a cold sweat. I had that nightmare again while working on this documentary. And I also get into a cold sweat when I think about a world where there are no more wild lonely farms and spaces where children and adults can have some kind of opportunity to do what I did so often while growing up to get out where you can hear the wind in the trees and the water lapping on the shore instead of the constant hum and whine and pounding of machinery or the artificial silence of well-insulated rooms where everything is right angles, light switches and fluorescent lights manufactured to our convenience but thoroughly artificial. Where you can get out at night and see the stars, really see them and know why it's called the Milky Way without the light pollution, that light noise pollution and other kinds we risk becoming too used to. Where you can experience the tranquility that only comes from being out in nature and knowing that you're a part of it. There's a scene in the dystopian 1973 thriller Soylent Green starring Charlton Heston that I use when I'm teaching introductory American history survey courses on the post Second World War period to try to explain to the students the enormous sea change that's taken place in our thinking about the environment from frankly not thinking about it at all to regarding it as a weirdo hippie preoccupation to having it be mainstream. Soylent Green is set on a planet that is so overcrowded and so polluted that nature has been destroyed. And Haston has a friend, an old man played by Edward G. Robinson, who can no longer stand the ruined planet. And he takes the government euthanasia option. And as he's lying there waiting for the lethal drugs to kick in, he is being shown scenes of nature, of the oceans, the prairies, the animals that used to be. And then Heston bursts into the room. He's looking for information on a case that he's working on. He's a policeman. But when he sees this vanished beauty, he is overcome with emotion. Tears roll down his cheeks and he says, how could I know? If you see it, it's Isn't it beautiful. We oh, yes. I told you. How could I know? How could I? How could I ever imagine? That scene resonates with just about everyone today. In the intervening years, we've done a lot of imagining what it would be like to live on a planet that we had ruined where nature was just a vanished memory, or perhaps something preserved in a few laboratories and behind glass. And one reason why is that back in 1968, we did have a kind of opportunity to see the Earth as though we were visitors. Because on Christmas Eve of 1968, Apollo 8 took that iconic Earthrise picture, the first time we'd ever seen our home planet from the outside. And people didn't just realize that it was beautiful, they realized that this was our only home, that if we messed this one up, there was nowhere else that we could go. And they realized that we were messing it up in all kinds of ways that were as bizarre as they were horrifying. Infamously, Ohio's Cuyahoga River bursting into flames in 1969, a river so polluted that it caught fire. And London's pea soup fogs, picturesque in fiction, but lethal in fact. And all kinds of questions arose about what we were putting into our food, as well as into our air and our water. And the result was a whole lot of environmental activism, of changes in the law, of changes in our habits and in our hearts, to deal with air pollution, poison in the water, toxins in the food supply. The stinging 
choking smog that used to hover over cities like Los Angeles is mostly gone from North America and Western Europe. Though tragically, it remains a major problem in many poorer countries, particularly the People's Republic of China. Life has returned to rivers and lakes that it was thought would be dead for decades. In Cleveland, they can even joke now about the once notorious river fires, a sign of just how much good the environmental movement can do when it concentrates on practical matters and thinks sensibly about them. The work's not done, but we have made enormous strides and we're happier and healthier for it.